Hello and welcome to this very special edition of Talking Europe brought to you from the Solvay Library here in Brussels. Well, although its goal was to show unity, a recent informal summit of 27 EU heads of state in Bratislava showed once again division across the bloc. The ongoing refugee crisis, the withdrawal of a member state, the rise of Eurosceptics, economic struggles. On many levels, the EU isn't working as well as it might do. So what can be done to turn things around? Well, in this edition, we're joined by not one, but two EU leaders to give us their insights. Welcome, please, Mr. Jean-Claude Juncker, your president of the EU Commission. Your party is that centre-right European People's Party. And across the other side of the table, we have the president of the European Parliament, Martin Schulz, your party, of course, the Socialist and Democrats. A very warm welcome to you both. Uh, Mr. Juncker, perhaps I can just start with yourself. You have said, that the EU is facing an existential crisis. That looks like a pretty bleak outlook for the EU. I didn't say that. It's what, reported what exactly like that. did you say? I said in parts, Europe is facing existential crisis, which is uh, quite a difference. But I do think that in parts of our doing together, we are facing uh, divergences of views. But the Bratislava summit was not a summit of uh, disunion because there was a large intersection of common views expressed uh, by uh, prime ministers and uh, uh, by the commission. It was not perfect. It could have been better, but it was not a disaster. Within a few minutes, we were hearing that the Italian prime minister wouldn't uh, take part in a joint press conference with the French and Germans. As a whole, on very sensitive issues like the refugee crisis, the EU can't seem to make plans to work together. Mr. Schulz, I mean, there, there is clearly a failing at the heart of the EU. Yes. The EU is not in a good shape because the member states are disunited. And they are disunited because of a lack of common European spirit. This virus of renationalization uh, entered also into the room of the heads of states and government. And therefore, I share the view of Jean-Claude. Bratislava was not a failure. It was not a step forward. But Which in uh, itself. But uh, it was visible and also in the conclusion uh, understandable that there is a certain commitment to stick together after the United Kingdom announced to leave the Union. Well, in the past, when we've looked at uh, the EU, we say the solution is to, to st form a stronger EU. But now we're hearing heads of state, uh, Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor, the Netherlands, Mark Rutte, saying the time for further integration is not now. Even Mark Rutte is saying uh, that actually we should go with the national when possible and the EU only when necessary. But I'm saying exactly the same. I, I was never of the opinion that the European Union should uh, transform itself into the United States of Europe. That's not the model we are, we are looking for. What can be done in a better way by national member states, by, by, by uh, local uh, authorities? It should be done on that level. The European Union should only deal with very big uh, issues. When I started my mandate like as a president of the Commission and when we were campaigning, the two of us, uh, before the European uh, Parliament's elections, we were saying that the European Union should be big on big things and timid and uh, uh, you, very you modest that, on, on, on smaller things. And that's exactly what we are doing. And yet, on the big things like this refugee crisis, that is where the EU is failing. We're no, seeing... not the EU is failing. Some member states are failing. That's the difference. But you really separate the, tw the 28 well, of still course, member because states because of the European, EU with the, the EU? The European Commission, back in May last year, was proposing a um, uh, way how to deal with the refugee crisis. The Parliament was backing that proposal in a very speedy way. The Council of Ministers was adopting the proposal of the Commission, but some member states did disagree. So the is European that a Union, problem for you, Mr. Schultz? There seems a complete as such separation was, between... The European Union as such and the institutions were acting and were proactive. Yeah, that's a big problem. So it is a big problem, not only for me. Listen, you are completely right with your question and uh, making the reference to Mark Rutte. Uh, the European Union should deal with the big challenges and not interfere in so smaller items. He's completely right. And the refugee crisis is a big challenge yeah. that and the EU is, isn't who dealing is blocking with. it? Several member states. If you, I take a, a figure, Germany received last year a million of refugees. If you distribute a million of refugees amongst 508 million Europeans in 28 countries, it's not a problem. But if only four or five countries have to tackle 
the challenge and when the country says we have nothing to do with it, then it is a problem. But then the so Parliament and the Commission don't have the power to, to get that message across to the member states, we to get adopted, them moving on We it? adopted rules and the member states are not applying so the rules. No. But, yeah. And the Council of Ministers, that means so that, the government, they did, they did adopt the rules, the Parliament and the Commission were proposing, but some member states, after the vote where they adopted it, yeah, were even, stepping what's, away. What's the, goal, what's the goal of your question? I presume... What's the to, solution, I to guess? Clarify, my... I, I, I presume to clarify the responsibilities. Well, so, I, yeah, I think I've and, understood uh, that. But... Here, I, I, I must add once more, uh, Europe was always strong when there was a spirit of unity and common solution. What we see today is a spirit of renationalization on big things. And uh, therefore, I think the failure is on the national level. So do we need to re-look at, at the way the EU works and the way the, the member states get together? I mean, there's no punishment for Hungary. We even heard Angela Merkel, German Chancellor, saying that, well, actually, we may have to re-look at these majority decisions because they clearly don't work. But <clears throat> you cannot impose solidarity. Solidarity has to come from the heart, and so we are trying so, to reach the points of view of those having not voted in favour of our proposal. But I am not here in a, in a meeting of the Commission or of the Council. But I'm curious, as an EU citizen, yeah, yeah. you know, I see I see them not coming on board. I see a decision they signed no, no, up no, to be made. No, but you have to see that most of the member states are agreeing with the policy the Parliament and the Commission were proposing. Some member states are not. You are talking about those who are not. Should we Let's put in a punishment? Let's talk answer. about those think, who are in favour. I think the answer to your question uh, leads to a conclusion. Solidarity is a principle and not cherry-picking. If countries say we want to get on the same economic level that the economic uh, strong member states, and therefore we need uh, sustainable financing on development, on rural investments, on uh, cohesion policy, they get that money by solidarity. If countries say we feel threatened uh, from Russia and therefore we need sanctions, they get that solidarity because it is a principle. And therefore, financial solidarity, political solidarity is justified. And if it then is about refugees, the same countries say we have nothing to do with it. Solidarity as a principle and not cherry picking. And if some countries put that principle in doubt, they put in doubt the basis of the European Union. And of course, this uh, cherry picking of elements that members can have will, of course, revolve around the UK's future relationship when, if indeed it triggers this Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty and formally starts its withdrawal process. The fact that they haven't triggered this Article 50, the fact that the EU institutions can put no pressure on the UK to do that, is that not a failure in the Lisbon Treaty? But that's a treaty. The treaty is leaving it leaves the to the decision coffee. of uh, the UK to trigger Article 50, the leave article. We cannot oblige them. But that leaves everybody else a bit handcuffed, a bit in jeopardy, no, waiting. No, but you have to give time to time. The British will make their decision when time is More right. Patience. I, we do think that time is right, but it's up to the British to make also uh, their decision, to take their decision. Also, yeah, I'm a little bit surprised, uh, honestly. Uh, maybe that this is a weakness of the treaty, but the same country in which the previous government asked the citizens, do you want to leave or to stay in the European Union? And the majority of the citizens said, we want to leave. The same government now is not triggering the article to leave. Why the question? Why is the question? Is it not a failure? Is, is it a failure of the treaty? It is a failure of the government of the United Kingdom. The fact that the UK hasn't triggered this Article 50, they say they need time to know what kind of relationship they want. It mm -hmm. appears they still don't understand. Does the EU know what kind of relationship it wants? But it depends on the way the United Kingdom will trigger Article 50. We are prepared. But uh, as we decided, the institutions and the 27 member states, we are not negotiating before notification. And as long as the notification is not there, I'm not negotiating. But we're, we're preparing what the e how yeah, the EU would are, like we, to yeah, yeah, yeah. hold things. We, 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 we have an idea. We, the EU we is know ready. What we, want. we are saying the, a country leaving, but uh, asking for a free access to the internal market has to respect the basic rules of the internal market, including and mainly the freedom of movement of the workers. So we are prepared for that debate.
Okay. Um, now, of course, the UK's vote to leave is being seen as the pinnacle of the rise of Euroscepticism that we are seeing growing really across the EU bloc. Uh, going to look at various issues of that. But firstly, a lot of it is, one, this image that the EU fails to make their decisions put into action, but also a negative Im image. And we've seen a lot surrounding the Commission in recent days and weeks. It, firstly, of the former President of the Commission, Emmanuel Barroso, Jose Emmanuel Barroso, taking the position at Goldman Sachs. It seems to be getting even more uh, serious. And we're now hearing that while he was President of the Commission, he was holding secret meetings with the banks, something he, of course, does deny. Uh, but is it time that we end or make a, a more strict division between politics and business and this revolving door that's seen between the Commission but, and... Uh, the facts you are mentioning, supposing that the facts are right, this has to be seen, uh, is not concerning the Commission uh, I, I'm presiding. It's, uh, it has nothing to do with the now Commission. And so we have to stop this blame game against the Commission. This Commission is not in charge of uh, what members of the former commission are doing. We were uh, introducing in our rules more strict transparency rules. More strict transparency rules. And we, now we are considering if yes or no, we should amend the code of conduct the commission has, other institutions don't, and the governments don't have. And so the commission is by far more strict and more severe when it comes to these issues. But you are right. We have to make sure and clear that the interrelations, the interlinks mm. between poli politics and uh, business are uh, transparent. But this is not only applying to the former commission, this is applying to all the governments in Europe. Politicians Union. in general. Well, oh, yeah. Let me look, because we have um, Michel Barnier is now the Brexit man, if you like, for the European Commission. He worked very closely. Uh, he was in Barroso's commission. Uh, Mr. Schulz, your opinion, do you think perhaps the EU, we need to look at his position? Because they worked closely together in the same commission. They're now both working on Brexit, one for a major bank, he, he one for the EU. He doesn't understand your question. Tell me. He doesn't understand your question because your question is totally ununderstandable. Why should Barnier draw conclusions as he was a member of the former commission yep. because Thank you Mr. Much. Barroso has taken office in, in the Goldman Sachs field. To, to negotiate for a bank on the Brexit issue and they were close in the past. Well, let's look at the other <coughs> issue but coming but out. Thank you very much for answering for me yeah. for, for the question. Did you have a, a separate opinion? How much time you give me to answer to such a complex question? Because for you, How I mean, much time you give me to answer to such a complex question? Yeah, unfortunately, time is also time. Uh -huh. always time. Okay. 18 months is the delay in, in declaring it. Look, so technically, Barroso... Uh, Michel but, Barnier is a man who served as Foreign Affairs Minister in France, who served as a member of the European Parliament, who served as a commissioner. To uh, put somebody under suspicion because he served in a commission presided by José because Manuel Barroso, I find it a little bit exaggerated. But do you do you feel Barroso can have an influence on EU politicians? Perhaps that's the better, the clearer question. Pardon? Do you think that Barroso leading Goldman Sachs or their Brexit mm. negotiations has that any impact? Is there anything to be worried about? No, no, no. I, I, I can't imagine that uh, my predecessor would. Uh, have uh, whatsoever influence on, on the, the doings of, of the Commission. No, that's, things are not working that way around. Yeah, but the case, the case of José Manuel Barroso is unacceptable, completely unacceptable. Mm. The previous, the president of the previous Commission who served for two mandates as president of the Commission, mm. two years after leaving from office, is now advisor for Goldman Sachs, the biggest investment bank in the world, on Brexit question is completely unacceptable. And uh, I, urge the no risk? I urge the President of the Commission to think about uh, improvements in the Code of Conduct, uh, and I know that they are thinking about that, but I share his view. We can't blame the Commission because of a former President of the Commission is, in my eyes, not doing the right things. Let's look uh, just very briefly at another former commissioner, um, Nelly Cruz. She was also in the spotlight uh, in recent weeks. She hadn't declared all her business interest, it turns out, uh, when she entered that commission. Uh, she says it's a clerical error. Um, the commission says it does rely on the honesty of commissioners coming into office. Um, but Mr. Schultz, it was your parliament, was it not, that validated Ms. Cruz as, as a commissioner. <coughs> Do new elements need to be put in place there? It was my parliament. It's not my private parliament. It was the European Parliament raising all the questions which are raised now in the hearings for Ms. Cruz. And uh, the parliament, I remember very well because I was the chairman of the socialist group in that time, had to make at the end the choice 
to vote because of Ms. Kroos against all the other commissioners or to let it go through because we can't vote about a single commissioner. It is the commission as a whole. The only uh, person which is voted separately is the president of the commission with a vote of confidence at the beginning, giving him a mandate. And Nelly Kroos went through because of that uh, rule. I think we should think if there is not individual votes for commissioners, but the European Parliament after the hearing of Nelly Cruz, made strong observations concerning, and I remember very well that it was the Dutch government which had proposed Nelly Cruz, complaining that the European Parliament was exaggerating. Okay, we've been looking briefly at past uh, politicians for the EU very quickly as we're running out of time. Let's look at the current ones. Mr. Martin Schulz, you're president of the European Parliament. Uh, you have had two mandates in that post, which is very rare. Um, and there's now questions coming up to whether or not you'll stay in office after January, which would be the time that you would hand over to European People's Party or a candidate of centre-right. Mm. Um, I take note that there is a lot of people thinking about my future. Amongst them, some who say I'm uh, doing a good job. I find this uh, not so bad that people think I'm doing a good job. I serve until the end of my mandate. And you're, you're ready for another third one, perhaps? The uh, problems you just raised that I have to answer in a high-speed answer way are so intensive that I invest the whole time of my daily work in Thank solving these problems. Uh, Mr. Juncker, I know that you're one man who does support the idea of uh, Mr. Schulz remaining as uh, the head of the European Parliament. Would you not prefer to see somebody from your EPP party? I'm in favour of stability when it comes to European institutions. I'm working closely and in the best way possible with the President of the European Council, Mr. Tusk, and with uh, Martin Schulz as the Chair of the European Parliament. I'm in favour of stability. If you are crossing difficult times, and Robert Waters, stability is of the essence. Okay, well, gentlemen, we're going to have to leave it there, but thanks indeed for your time. Thanks also, of course, to you at home for having watched today with us. We'll be joined after the break by a number of leading MEPs to get their views on the future of Europe. See you then.